Welcome to AP Bio. We're going to jump right into our first lecture, which is going to be about the scientific method. Now, you already probably know quite a bit about the scientific method, so let's run through the general steps. So we start with a question that we're trying to answer. We collect some background information, and then we form a hypothesis, which we know is an educated guess. We then perform our experiment, and then we analyze the data that we collect, and we draw a conclusion. So let's start with a very simple sample problem that we did in class. So suppose your friend says that listening to music will help you study for tests. So you want to know if this is accurate. And so what you're going to do is you're given a group of students and you're going to design a simple experiment. So here's what most people came up with. Group A, they're going to listen to music while they study. And then group B, they are not going to listen to any music while they study. And let's just assume that the groups that we're starting with, let's just assume that they're cohesive, they usually make similar grades. Let's just say that nobody in the group currently listens to music, so this is something new for all of them. They're all going to take the same tests. Maybe we'll control that they all listen to the same kind of music, and we're definitely going to give all of them the same study material. So we're going to design. So if you basically came up with that, you kind of designed a simple controlled experiment. We've got two groups. One is receiving this new variable. One is not receiving the variable, and we know that we're going to know whether music helps or not because we're going to measure a test that they're going to take. All right, so our hypothesis, or our educated guess, is basically a prediction of what we think is going to happen. And it needs to describe the specific relationship we expect to see. Like, we wouldn't say our prediction is that music helps students study. Our prediction would say something along the lines of Students who listen to music while studying will perform better on the weekly test than those that do not listen to music. So our prediction specifically tells us the relationship we're going to be looking for. Now, you're not usually required to write an if-then hypothesis, but if you were going to put this in if-then form, you would say something along the lines of if music helps students study, then the group of students who listen to music while they study will perform better on the weekly tests. This is what we're going to be measuring than the students who do not listen. So we know exactly what we're comparing and exactly what results are going to either support or reject this hypothesis. Now, there is a problem with predictions. Let's think about this. You may not have ever really thought about this unless you've done research. Let's say that we run our test and this is the result that we get. The ones who listen to music, the average test score is a 97. But the ones that don't listen to music, their average test scores is 72. Now, I asked it for a show of hands in class, and most people agreed they would probably conclude music helped those students study for the test. And I said, well, what if instead the ones who listen to music had an average test score of 84, and the ones who didn't listen to music had an average test score of 80? Now I had less people raise their hand because people weren't necessarily sure. And keep in mind, it's, we tested a bunch of kids. So 84 is the average, but some scored higher, some scored lower. Might want to know how many kids were in that group. That's going to play a role, right? If it was only three kids or versus 100 kids, that might make a difference. And then I said, well, what if one group got an 87 and the group with no music got an 85? And now, like, nobody raised their hand. So here's the problem that we run into. Who's to decide how big the difference has to be to say that music may have an effect? I mean, technically, 87 is higher than 85, so why did nobody raise their hand? So you run into this issue, how do you know there's enough of a difference to say that the music helped? So here's the solution to that. Here's how science sort of works around that. Instead of making just a prediction, we also make what's called a null hypothesis. Now, a null hypothesis is set up so that we can disprove it or, or support it statistically. In other words, here's what we're going to say. We're going to say there's going to be no relationship between the variables. In other words, you could word this a couple of ways, but we're basically going to say either listening to music will have no effect on the scores, and you can do present tense or future tense, or you could say differences in test scores between those who listen to music and do not are due to random chance, which sounds kind of weird. Like, if you're like, but I thought music was supposed to help. Yes, that's your prediction, but your null hypothesis is specifically stating you expect there to be no difference. Now, why are we going to do that? Because I'm going to show you in another lecture 
so, uh, a couple of ways that we can do it, what's called a statistical analysis. We're going to plug numbers in, our actual numbers, our data. And from that data, we're going to actually get a cutoff number. If our students' differences are bigger than that cutoff number, scientists across the world will agree there seemed to be an effect. Music affected studying. And if our results, when we plug them into all this statistical analysis, are below that cutoff number, we're going to be able to say, no, even though one group might have had a slightly higher score, it's not a big enough difference. It could just be due to random chance. So in other words, this is going to give us a concrete accept or reject numerically, mathematically. So we're going to state we expect no difference. And then if there is a difference, we're going to reject our hypothesis, which again may seem a little weird because you're kind of used to uh, wanting to accept your hypothesis, right? That's your whole goal is I want to be right, uh, but not for a null. For a null, you're kind of hoping that you're going to reject that hypothesis because if you reject it, it means there was a difference. So those that listen to music scored statistically better. Music seems to cause uh, an improvement in studying versus, no, not a big enough difference. We're going to say that the two groups were basically the same and any differences were just due to random chance. So we'll get more into that later. Let's jump into parts of a controlled experiment. So moving on, our independent, also called manipulated variable, this is the thing that you are changing. You manipulated it. It's in your control. So in our music experiment, the experimental group which is the group that's receiving that change, this would be the group that listened to music. Now we've got to compare them to something. So we had a second group, we called it our control group. Don't say this is a group that's left alone. That kind of implies it's just a group of students and they just randomly take the test. That's not true. The second group of students studied the same material, took the same test, had similar study environment. All of those other things were the same. The only difference between our two groups is that the control group did not receive the independent variable. So be careful when you define it. Don't say it's a group that's left alone. And so this would be the group that did not listen to music. Now, if you're asked on an AP exam, what was the purpose of the group? Like, let's say this was group A that listened to music, and this was group B, and they say, what was the purpose of group B? Please don't say it was a comparison. You want to say, oh, it gives a baseline score for what the test scores are like without music, or it might rule out external factors that are affecting the results of the test. I mean, if everybody does bad on the test, that might tell us something. So um, be careful. Don't just say for comparison. Try to be specific. What information specifically is our control group providing? Now, another thing that you may not have learned before is that there are actually two kinds of control groups. Now, not every experiment has both. Be careful about that. Don't assume when you get to an experiment, oh, Ms. Calder said, I've got to find the positive and the negative control group. No, 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 no. Some experiments only have one of these. Now, the one that you're more familiar with that you've always probably called a control group your whole life would actually be this one. The negative control group is the group that doesn't receive the treatment, like the group with no music. That's a negative control group. You do not expect a change. You expect the normal result from that group, right? Nothing new is going to happen. A positive control group, some experiments have. I'll show you some examples in a moment. There would not be one in our music experiment, by the way. It shows us that the test is working properly. Typically, it's a group that's given a different treatment, but it's a treatment that we do expect to cause the result. So let me show you an example, because that can be kind of confusing. Most people get the negative one right away. Positive is a little more challenging. Let's say you're testing plants and how they grow in different wavelengths of light. So you're going to put a plant under red light, blue light, green light, purple light, etc. I might have, as a negative control group, a plant in the dark. They receive no light. So negative, taking away, makes sense. No light. And what do I expect? No growth. So then I'm expecting the ones in the different colors of light to have better growth than the one in the dark. A positive control group might be this. What if my plants are just bad? What if my plants are infected with a fungus and they all die and I don't realize they're infected? I just assume, wow, no color of light is good for plants. Red, blue, they all die. So a positive control group, I might put a plant in the sunlight. 
Now, I already know, positive, I already know that sunlight should cause growth. If this plant doesn't grow, there's something wrong with my plants. So this one I do expect. It would show me my experiments working. Yes, my plants are normal, my plants are healthy, my plants are growing. Now, when I test them in red, green, blue, if they don't grow, I'm going to know it's the light and not something wrong with the plant. Another good experiment uh, or another good example of this would be a medical test. If you've ever taken a COVID test or a strep test, there's a positive control line. If you take a COVID test and you get this result on the right here, you can't say, I don't have COVID. It didn't turn pink. Yeah, but this didn't turn pink either. So there's something wrong with my test. This, this one, the control line is treated with something that should purposely make the test be positive. Here's one more quick example. Let's say you want to test if lettuce from your store has bacteria. You heard your lettuce is contaminated. You're a little worried. So you go get some lettuce from the store. You swab it with a Q-tip. And at home, you prepare some Petri dishes. And on those Petri dishes, you put nutrient agar, which is like food for your bacteria. You take a sterile Q-tip and you swab the plate. And then in 24 hours, you're going to see if, if bacteria grows. And your idea is that if bacteria grows, it means, yep, my lettuce was contaminated. So a positive control group that might be important here is I might take a dish and I might purposely infect it with bacteria. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, what if I did a really bad job of setting up my plates and my agar is bad? Then my lettuce, even if it does have bacteria, nothing's going to grow because my plates are bad. So a positive control group should have growth. It shows that my plates are capable of growing bacteria. And then my negative control, I'm going to take a sterile Q-tip and I'm going to swab the plate without touching bacteria. Nothing should grow here. Negative, no growth. If something grows here, it means my plates are contaminated, which again means my experiment's bad because if something grows on my negative control, then even if it grows on the one that I got from the lettuce, I can't say it was from the lettuce because my plates were contaminated. So that would be another example of where you might see both. All right, finally, last parts of the experiment, controlled variables or constants. These are the things that you want to be the same for all your groups. So for our music experiment, we said they take the same test, listen to the same kind of music, be provided with the same study materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody receives these, this, this stuff the same so that we know that if there is a difference between our two groups, it's because of our variable. And then finally, our dependent or respondent variable, responding, that is what we're measuring. And you can have more than one of these. You can only change one thing at a time. You can't change the amount of fertilizer and the amount of light on the plant because you won't know which thing caused the results. But you might be measuring multiple things. If I want to know if something, if a fertilizer is good, maybe I want to look at lots of stuff. You know, are the leaves green? Does it make lots of flowers? Does it grow fast? Does it grow tall? So you might measure multiple things. Now, real quick, here's an, an example. Let's say you're checking a new acne medication. You have three groups, 16-year-old males. They all have acne. They all receive the following treatments. A gets a standard treatment that we already know works. B gets medicine X. That's the one we're testing. And C gets a sugar pill, placebo. At the end, we check the number of pimples they have. Let's talk about the parts of this experiment. So our independent variable would be the treatment they received, right? Some got a placebo, some got medicine X, some got doxycycline. That's your independent. Your dependent, that would be the number of pimples. That's what we're going to measure. What would be these three groups? Well, group A would be a positive control. We know this should treat pimples, so this group should get better. Group B, this is our experimental group because we don't know what to expect. Hopefully, similar groups, similar to A or better than A, or as good of, as A, but maybe with less side effects. And then group C, this would be our negative control group. Their pimples should not get better. So our prediction would be that group B, if we're right, should have less pimples at the end of the month than group C. You don't necessarily need to include the doxycycline here. It's really, like I said, just to ensure your experiment's working. But your prediction should specifically say that you expect Medicine X, those students, to have less pimples than those that receive the sugar pill. Your null hypothesis would be that Group B and Group C would have similar numbers of pimples or that Medicine X will have no effect on the number of pimples that students receive. Um, no difference. 
And finally, controlled variables, there's three mentioned here. They're all 16, they're all males, they all have severe acne.